Well, let's see. This is supposed to be a plenary address. I'm not quite sure what the difference is between a plenary address and a sermon. My beloved professor and mentor, Paul Lehman, who I talk about a lot, you know how it is with professors and mentors. You talk about them a lot if they meant something to you. Um, he lectured, of course, at Union Theological Seminary, and he would give the usual 50-minute lecture, but the last 10 minutes would clearly be a sermon. It really was very exciting. It was very scholarly for a while. But then he would come out from behind the lectern and start prowling up and down the aisles, looking people in the eye directly and making the appeal of the gospel directly at the end of a lecture. It was unforgettable. So um, I don't know whether this is a plenary address or a sermon or a lecture or what it is, but my guess is it will, my, my prayer is, in fact, let me offer a prayer to that effect. Let us pray. Almighty God, blessed Lord Jesus Christ, gracious Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, one and undivided, dwell with us today. Make yourself known to us and speak, Lord, through your word for your servants here. Amen. Last night, I paused before the sermon to comment on the genius of Charles Wesley in the hymn that we sang, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in My Savior's Blood? This hymn contains in five verses virtually the entire teaching of the New Testament about the achievement of Christ crucified. Wesley weaves in the imagery of blood sacrifice, substitution, exodus, deliverance from bondage, victory over sin, and recapitulation, the first and second Adam. Since it is a very personal hymn, though, there's one thing missing from it, and that is the universal and cosmic note. For that, we can look at Wesley's towering Advent hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. And so these two hymns of Charles Wesley encompass much of what I would want to say this morning about preaching Christ crucified. Most particularly this morning, I'd like to point out just one line in the last verse of Wesley's hymn, which is closely related to my subject this morning. The verse goes like this, no condemnation now I dread. And that, of course, is directly from Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Wesley is quoting scripture all the time throughout his hymns, as you know, but as your congregation also needs to know. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Be bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Now the phrase that fits this address or sermon or whatever it is particularly is clothed in righteousness divine. This is the destination of the saints. This is the note of the Reformation. And back before that, of Augustine, and most especially of Paul the Apostle. And before that, the Old Testament and its constant testimony to the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God, the dikaiosune theou in Greek, 
is the essential gift of the age to come, which awaits those who watch for Christ. The word righteousness and the word justification in English mean exactly the same thing in Greek. The dikaiosuni theou, the righteousness of God, also means the power of God for justification. Same word. And the origins in the, New Test in the Old Testament are manifold. In the Torah, in the Psalms and Prophets, the righteousness of God is a major theme. We have almost lost it today to our great impoverishment. Today I hope to point to the righteousness of God as a way of understanding what happened in the crucifixion of Christ. A key verse for this is 2 Corinthians 5.21, and Charles Wesley was thinking of this verse. For our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In many ways, one of the key verses in all of Paul's epistles. Now the name of this address this morning is not exactly as advertised, though it is closely related. The name of this address is, Are You a Galatian or a Corinthian? One sunny day on Morningside Heights in New York City, my phone is ringing. I hope it's the Holy Spirit. I usually don't even carry my phone with me, let alone. Shut up. I can't even find it. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's stuck. Let me shut it off. <laughs> if I can remember how to shut it off. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Power off. I barely know how to use a cell phone, let alone have it carrying around ringing with me. <laughs> okay, again, walking out to have lunch, Morningside Heights, New York City, many years ago, this was one of those blessed transitions which takes place after graduation when a professor that you idolized is becoming a friend one of the great things that happens in life. As we strolled along, we briefly chatted about a distressing personal conflict that was going on at the seminary between one particular faculty member and several others. The behavior of that particular professor, let's call him Jack, was becoming increasingly antagonistic and self-centered. My friend, the New Testament professor, said something that day that has stayed with me all these years. He said, simply and quietly, Jack doesn't believe that he's justified. Now the subject of justification is indeed very closely related to the subject of maturity, endurance, stamina, charity, and long-suffering staying power, hupomone, long-suffering staying power, sometimes translated patience. Dorothy Day said, patience, patience, the very word means suffering. The subject of justification is closely related to suffering to long-suffering, staying power and maturity in ministry. How are we to find the center from which to operate for the long haul? What is that center? Where is that center? 
When that conversation about Jack, the unhappy faculty member who didn't believe that he was justified, took place, it was the late 70s. A lot of people in the mainline churches in the States were coming down, just coming down off the high of social action after the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement, and it was a high. But coming down from that height, there was tremendous confusion about what the center was. At the same time, the more or less conservative evangelical churches, the Bible-believing churches, were pursuing a parallel path that converged with the main lines not at all. And yet today, speaking of the American church in any case, in both of these tracks, the mainline and the evangelical, the clergy are said to be suffering from burnout and their families are struggling with all kinds of problems including adultery, divorce, drugs, pornography, financial scandals, and suicide. I'm here to make a relatively simple proposal so simple that it may seem simple-minded. My proposal is that all of us who are in ministry need to know that we are justified. Now that sounds so obvious, and in a way it is, but in another way it's not obvious at all. Let's take a look this morning at two of the churches that Paul the Apostle planted, nurtured, upbuilt, and then left so that he could go on and plant some more. You know these churches, the Corinthians and the Galatians. More than any of Paul's other congregations, these two were in big trouble, and they didn't even know it. We have the impassioned letters that Paul wrote to these churches in this crisis to recall them to the gospel they had heard from him, the charisma that had called their congregations into being. The future of the Christian faith is still, to this day, defined by these letters. The two churches had opposite problems. I'm going to be simplifying a little bit, but I hope not too much. The congregation, excuse me, the Corinthians, as you know, were a super spiritual, charismatic congregation. And the Galatians were on the verge of becoming a legalistic congregation. The Galatians didn't think they were justified, and the Corinthians didn't think they needed to be justified. My friend, the New Testament professor, said this about the Corinthians. He said, they took the ball that Paul passed to them and ran out of the stadium with it. That should remind us of Marcion, of whom it was said that he understood Paul so well that he misunderstood him. The Galatian church was exactly the opposite. They came under the spell of some new teachers, we used to call them the Judaizers, new teachers who were attempting to reintroduce boundaries and restrictions, in other words, the rule of law. As Paul says to them in great alarm, they were about to trade in the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. Okay, here's another story. I heard it years ago. It may be a true story and it may not. In any case, please don't take it literally. I think of it as a sort of parable. The scene is in the 1970s or 1980s at a weekend retreat for young adult Christians. A speaker presents a rousing exposition of Galatians all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. No one is justified by works of the law. For freedom Christ has set us free. 
Stand fast, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. At the break, two young women walk out together onto a balcony. One of them took out a half-smoked pack of cigarettes and said, I've been in slavery to smoking for years. I was so moved by that message of freedom in Christ, I'm going to throw out these cigarettes right now. She started to toss them over the railing when the other woman grabbed her by the wrist and said, don't do that. I feel so free. I'm going to smoke my first cigarette right here and now. Now, as I say, don't take it literally. We all know that smoking is bad. But I've always liked that story because in its over-the-top way, it illustrates the new state of affairs that exists in Christ crucified and risen. As Paul writes at the end of his letter to the Galatian church, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is not only a new human being that has come into the world. It is a new world, a new creation, a new cosmos in which the old distinctions between godly and ungodly, spiritual and unspiritual, righteousness according to the law and righteousness according to the gospel, the dikaiosuni, theu, the righteousness of God. These distinctions have come to an end in the cross of Christ. Now the story about the cigarettes has a certain Lutheran cast to it. At Grace Church in New York, where I served many years ago, at the height of the renewal there, a group of our young, uh, young adults, many of them refugees from fundamentalist churches, rented a beach house for the weekend. As I was told the story later, a good deal of carousing went on and a good deal of celebrating Paul's announcement that sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Sin boldly was the watchword. Over against this, however, we place Paul's protest in Romans 6. What then? Are we to continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Every preacher needs to figure out how to navigate that tricky relationship between the law and the gospel, to which confidentially I do think Calvin remains the best guide. But in any case, the Corinthians had their own version of the relationship, somewhat like the kids at the beach house. They grabbed the ball and ran out of the stadium, so to speak. I remember clergy like this in the late 60s. They were so liberated that they became libertines. So we understand why the Corinthian congregation required a different approach from Paul than the Galatians did. Charismatic phenomena were rampant in Corinth, especially glossolalia, but also claims to special wisdom. Sophia. And the result of this claim to special wisdom, special charism, special spiritual knowledge. The result of this was a division into camps which came close to breaking Paul's heart. Those famous chapters 13 and 15 of 1 Corinthians really should not be detached from chapters 12 and 14, which are vitally important in order to connect his points. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same God who inspires them all in every one. 
To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You see, what Paul is worried about is the hierarchy that was emerging in Corinth. The hierarchy was not about the common good. It was based on who had the most spiritual wisdom. There were pneumaticoi in the congregation, spiritual persons, members who were set up as more spiritual than others. Paul says, on the contrary, they are still children of the flesh, sarks, children of the flesh, not of the spirit. And you know that has nothing to do with material and immaterial. It has to do with the reign of sin and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word wisdom comes in for a certain amount of sarcasm from Paul in 1 Corinthians. We should remember that. Later in the letter, he, dis he directs a similar sarcasm to the word knowledge, which is gnosis, as in Gnosticism. You possess knowledge, you say? Let me tell you about knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone knows something, Paul goes on, he does not yet know what he ought to know. But if one loves God, one is known by God. That's a key passage. Notice the way that Paul shifts the verb to know from the Corinthians to God. God's knowledge of us is prior to our love for and knowledge of him. What's important, Paul says, is not your spiritual knowledge. What's important is that you are known by God before you, before you know him. You are known by him before you know him. I'm saying all this out of a particular context. I don't know if it's as overwhelming in Canada as it is in the States. I meant to bring a clipping with me from an Episcopal newsletter, but I lost it. Anyway, this clipping in the newsletter from an Episcopal diocese is about a new initiative which promises renewal and growth for congregations. I think we should always be wary of those kinds of promises. It is only the promise of God that's really trustworthy. But in any case, programs do tend to promise things. Now this clipping describing the program has a little picture, and the picture is captioned, the spiritual continuum. Now I don't mean to be unnecessarily critical of a sincere effort, but this little illustration that I'm gonna tell you about is pure Gnosticism. It's the Corinthians all over again. There are four little stained glass windows in the picture going up like this. And there are four stages of ascent. Explore, grow, deepen, and center. Now this is theologically dangerous. People get the idea that the Christian life is an ever ascending staircase of progress to a goal, a continuing development of mastery, if you will, in spiritual discipline. That's very Corinthian. It divides the so-called spiritual members, the pneumaticoi, from the unspiritual, so-called. Now this can really be deeply discouraging for those who have no aptitude for the prescribed path. 
Talk about searching for the center is common in many churches today, in the States anyway. People are encouraged to find your center, find your center, or to walk around a labyrinth until they arrive at the center. In the New Testament gospel, we do not look for a spiritual center. The center, who is Jesus Christ, has come to us and is already present in us, whether we feel it or not. When you understand that you have been acted upon by the grace of God, irrespective of, irrespective of any merit you can ever earn, whether spiritual or unspiritual, it makes all the difference in the world. There is nothing we can add to this gift of God to make it more real or more valid or more lasting. Now, it is true that Paul says, for instance, in Philippians, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. But that is a strikingly eschatological passage. It is not rooted in human effort, spiritual or otherwise. It is rooted in the promised future of the day of Christ Jesus. Understanding the gospel is recognizing that the active agent, not only in our call, but in our continuing and in our completion, the active agent is not me or you, but God. Paul states this clearly from the outset in Philippians. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. God who began a good work in you God will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. I was convicted of this when I was very young because the Book of Common Prayer spoke of all our works begun, continued, and ended in Thee, O Lord. All our works begun, continued, and ended in God. The former mayor of New York City, Ed Koch, used to ask everyone he met from taxi drivers to ambassadors, how am I doing? This was partly serious and partly just a shtick, but the question is one that troubles most people from the cradle to the grave. And the, the teachers in Galatians were holding it like a club over the head of that congregation. How are you doing? How well are you doing? How well are you doing in the sight of God? How well are you doing in the eyes of those who might judge you? When you have absorbed the message of God's going before and following after grace, it really does free you from worrying about how you are doing. I think that's worth repeating. I'm repeating it to myself, really. When you have absorbed the message of God's going before and following after grace, it really does free you from worry about how you are doing. I don't think there is any warrant in Scripture for this sort of anxiety about how we are doing. God is using you in spite of yourself. We aren't responsible for making progress. Whatever progress is made will be the gift of God. Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Who will descend into heaven to bring Christ down? Who will descend into the abyss to bring Christ up? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. <laughs> 
the word of faith which we apostles preach. The Christian life is not a staircase of progress, spiritual or otherwise, spiritual or moral. That is one of the great insights of the Reformation, which I believe we should hang on to. Actually, I, don't, I try not to use the word should, and I just did. I believe that it, it would be of great benefit to us and to the church if we hang on to this great biblical insight of the Reformation. The Christian life is not one of spiritual and moral progress. The grace of God for us is new every morning because we are just as incapable today as we were yesterday. Finitum non capax infiniti. There is great comfort in knowing that we are just as incapable today as we were yesterday, especially, let me tell you, when you get really old. There is great, great comfort in knowing that God knows our incapacity and it is, it is his good pleasure to work through us just the same. Gnosis, spiritual knowledge, is a treacherous concept leading to a lot of problems for the church and for individual Christians. I've seen it over and over. Christians who worry that they simply aren't good enough or spiritual enough or persevering enough or gifted enough to be even remotely like St. Francis or Mother Teresa or that person in the prayer group who seems to be so far ahead of everybody else. Concerning this problem, Paul writes to the Corinthians about his own ministry. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything. Our competence is from God who has made us competent. Such is the confidence that we have. And so, finally, back to justification. What does it take? to believe and trust that one is justified already, that one is safe in the everlasting arms of God already without any qualifications. As it happened, the Corinthians actually did believe this, but they believed in it from the wrong perspective. They believed that they had attained a level of existence an, a, a level of existence that was equivalent to spiritual resurrection. And that's why Paul wrote chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians to correct that mistake. The Galatians, on the other hand, mistrusted the gospel of the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. They mistrusted it so thoroughly that they were prepared to rebuild the whole structure of do's and don'ts all over again. Thus, the Galatians also, in their way, want to rebuild the stepladder. Their prescription for ascending the ladder is observance of the law rather than cultivating spiritual hierarchy as in Corinth. But in both cases, there is a hierarchy. And in both, both cases, the arrow is pointing the wrong way. The arrow is pointing from us to God instead of the other way round. In the gospel, the movement is always from God to us. It is always the journey of the Son of God into the far country, as Karl Barth beautifully said. It is the final, it, it is the journey of the Son of God into the far country, not our spiritual journey that counts. If it were dependent on your spiritual journey and my spiritual journey, we would be lost. It is the journey of God to us that makes the gospel. In the final analysis, both the Corinthians and the Galatians made the same central mistake. They both turned away from the cross of Christ. Christ. 
Paul reminds the Corinthians with their vaunted knowledge. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want to say that again because I want to make sure you get the emphasis, a somewhat sardonic <laughs> twist on the word emphasis. Paul is dead serious, of course, but he's using a little bit of a verbal trick by taking the word knowledge from the Corinthians and putting it into a completely different context. I decided to know nothing among you, none of this spiritual ascent stuff, nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And to the Galatians, Paul wrote, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Paul is speaking here of his own preaching of the cross that the Galatians seem to have forgotten. They forgot that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Galatians 3. Why did Christ die? He died for our justification. The unconditional covenant with Abraham has been given the primacy over the conditional covenant made with Moses. God shows his love for us, Romans 5, God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, we are now justified by his blood. The Greek word for justification, dikaiosuni, carries with it a power of incomparable significance. In Greek, the same word, righteousness, justification, dikaiosuni, same word, the righteousness of God, noun, righteousness is a noun, the righteousness of God and God's justification, verb, of sinners is the same thing. The righteousness of God and God's justification of sinners, same word, it's the same thing. God has the power to endow the human being with his own righteousness. And this is what he has done, is doing, and will do. The righteousness divine of which Charles Wesley writes. Again, in English, righteousness is a noun. It sounds like something that God has and that maybe we can acquire. But justification carries with it, same word in Greek, the force of a verb. Everything depends on our understanding that. God essentially is a verb, not a noun. It is a word, this word, of incomparable power. God has justified us in Christ, not by works of the law, not by spiritual discipline, not by the attainment of knowledge, not by programs, not by churches busting, bursting at the seams, or by anything else from our end of things. The entire cosmos of human religious striving has been declared dead and buried by the invading power of the righteousness of God in the cross of Jesus Christ, by which we are clothed, justified, by virtue of which we are clothed in righteousness divine. God made him to be sin who knew no sin, 
in order that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what happened on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to be sin, whatever that means. It's a strange verbal construction. God made his own son to be sin. In other words, the father and the son never divide them. The father and the son together are working that Jesus should become sin even though he knew no sin in order that we would become the righteousness of God. And so, here is the triumphant conclusion of Paul's letter to the Galatians. May it be ours today and always. Far be it from me to glory in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the cosmos has been crucified to me and I to the cosmos. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Henceforth, let no human being trouble me, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I don't want to break the silence too soon because I know it means something. May it mean that little flames of the Holy Spirit are coming down on your heads and my head, not by our power, but by his power. Am I supposed to bring us to a conclusion? I thought you would, Peter. Somebody needs to tell us what to do next. said a prayer, but I felt that I did. I think we should sing a hymn. What? I think we should sing a hymn. Oh, that would be good. Why don't we sing the last two verses of And Can It Be again? Do people have the words? They're in the hymn book. Oh, all right. Um, With no see. accompaniment? Maybe that'll work? We're Baptists here. We? Yeah. <laughs> Over to you. Or should we sing, Lo, he comes with, maybe we should have sung, Lo, he comes with clouds. The last two verses are great. It's 426, and we'll sing the last two verses. Is there somebody who can pitch it if it's not? And I'm going to need your help. We're sta we'll stand if we can, and begin with, Long my imprisoned spirit lay. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound. 
to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance on us all and give us peace. <laughs>